Hello and welcome to another episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. 80 years ago today, on the 15th of September 1940, a large-scale air battle raged above southern England between the Royal Air Force and the German Luftwaffe. By the end of the day, the spirit of the German Air Force had been broken and the planned invasion of England by Hitler's army was quashed. To commemorate this historical event, I have decided to do a Battle of Britain-themed makeover. I hope that you enjoy the show. This will be the main subject model of this makeover. It is a Skybusters number no. 8, the Spitfire, and these first came out in 1973. And these particular Spitfires were donated by a person known as Baudet from Barry in Wales. So thank you, Baudet. So here's one of the main types of Spitfires that I have. The paint scheme on it is very ordinary. You can see it's kind of stenciled on there. It's got bright green on a sort of metallic brown base. There's also no decals on the underside of the wing or on the fuselage. This undercarriage is broken and I have decided to remove the undercarriages on these models and instead make some 3D printed stands to display them. I still don't know exactly where I'm going with this makeover but I'm hoping it's going to turn out all right in the end. So as usual, I'm going to split the model first so I can paint strip it and repaint it. Quite a simple job, just two rivets to drill out on the underside. In the background, you can see a photograph of a real Spitfire that I downloaded off the internet for inspiration. Now using this mobile phone separation tool, I gently prized the upper and lower fuselage apart. It was quite easy really and there was quite a, a gap between the two pieces. The seam was quite obvious as you probably saw. That's how the undercarriage has been prevented from falling out over the years. It's just that square block in a square hole slid forward and held in place by the underside of the fuselage. There's also a three-bladed prop here that is retained by a flange on the end of the spindle. As you can see, this is stamped the SB8. That there is a tiny little wheel, an unusual feature to include, that goes underneath the rear rudder. Maybe it made it skid along the carpet a little bit easier. The canopy on this one has been yellowed probably by sunlight and age. I'm not too sure how to make these much brighter. It's not my area of speciality, I really should look into it. Um, however, I've got sufficient to be going on with, so I'm hoping to reuse them and at the end, the models should look quite good, even though the canopies won't be 100% new looking. To put this back together as per normal, I'm going to be using some of those two domed headed Allen screws that are between three and four millimeters in length. They're two millimeters, so I'm using a 1.5 millimeter drill to drill out the hole, which I'm going to tap to put the new screws in. So that I don't go too deep, I'm using a little bit of heat shrink over the drill as a guide. So I've just slipped that sleeve over there, and when you heat heat shrink, as its name suggests, it shrinks. And prevents me, or gives me a guide rather, as to how deep I can drill. So if I go down to the end of the heat shrink, it should be deep enough to accommodate the entire threaded section of the screw. As I go, I have to remember to clean out the flutes on the drill because they block up with this soft metal and the drill uh, can seize and snap off in the hole if you don't keep it clean. So I've done the front and the rear posts. I'm now going to tap them with this little thread tapper. And for change, I just dipped it in a little bit of oil that I had in my hobby room. I used to do this all the time, I don't often do it now, but I must admit that I think this particular tap may be getting a little bit blunt, and so a little bit of oil could help it do its job. Again, as with the drill, 
you have to concentrate on cleaning out the tool to prevent it from clogging and to make things a little bit easier with the cutting of the thread. I'll put the oil away safe so I don't knock it over and put these screws in and just testing that they go all the way home and the head sits up flush with the post. Because it does, I know when I put this thing back together it's going to be clamped together tight. So here's another type of Spitfire that I've got. The one on the left is a horrible gold and green. You thought the first one didn't look realistic. Well, this one is completely out of the ordinary. It's also got a different style of undercarriage. Whereas one was a plastic block, this one is a piece of sprung steel wire. There's also some castings underneath the wing there, which are air intakes. And I believe that on the real thing, that they were used to cool the machine guns. So these are probably slightly different marks of Spitfire. Well, I couldn't have a Battle of Britain special without a German aircraft. Uh, unfortunately, this is the only one I have. This also came out in 1973, and it's a Sky Busters 7, a Junkers 87 Stuka. Now, I had an idea, thinking ahead, that I might try and cast some spare windscreens in some silicon. So I've just immersed one of the original windscreens from the Spitfire into this silicon, and I'm going to let it harden. And the plan is to either use some arrow dye or maybe some epoxy resin of some description and attempt to make up a new windscreen. Well, two days later, I struggled to get the windscreen out. It's stuck fair and square in there. And the mold that I was hoping to use is completely destroyed when I'm removing the original windscreen. So that's one thing that didn't work out for me. So I'll have to come up with a, a different plan. Anyway, moving on, it's time to paint strip these models. Now, because these are different types of paint, I thought I'd just do a little test here and just wipe some of this paint stripper on there and see whether one reacts better than the other. Uh, basically, there isn't really that much difference between the two types of paint. And the paint stripper seems to work equally well on both models. Little bit of time lapse there for fun. Looks so cool. Have a look at this piece. Right, I'm thinking this paint's going to come off pretty easy. And what do you know, it did. Now you can look at the detail in this, which is somewhat limited. There's some exhaust outlets on the front and a kind of lump in the cockpit to resemble a seat. Not much else, really. Anyway, I'm going to give these a quick clean up with the Dremel and the wire brush. Get rid of any tiny little bits of paint that may be left and also try and remove some oxidization that I've noticed. Just in here where it's cast, it says made in Thailand. The paint is clinging on there for dear life in amongst all those letters. It takes me a little while to clean that up. You can see the casting on this is very ordinary, not up to the usual standard of Matchbox. Anyway, as I said before, early on, I'm going to make some stands to display these models when I've finished. And I'm actually going to be giving three of them away. And I'll tell you more about that towards the end, when I do the grand reveal. So this is my Flash Forge Finder printer here. It's using PLA filament. And I hang it up there because it used to get knotted up and jam. Well, how many have I done here? I printed five of these. I think I end up printing six. And I pick the best ones to use for the models. This is always a little bit tricky, getting them off the printing board here. You spread some uh, paper glue on there to get the first level to stick. Otherwise, you run the risk of ruining the print. 
and then you have to struggle to get it off at the end. This one I used a different PLA, it's more like a sort of an opaque colour and it doesn't look very good so I've decided I'm not going to use that colour. Instead I'm going to use the white ones and because there is like a fine grain on the finished print I'm just using some very thin body filler and I'm going to go over it a couple of times and sand these stands down and try and make them look smooth. And I've also made that square block on the end of the stand to go into the hole where the undercarriage was sitting. It should look good. So I've got to make a, a heap of these adapters to go into the hole underneath the wing. And these are going to attach to the original stand. The original stand, by the way, I downloaded from Thingiverse, which is a great source for 3D objects to print. Now that hole there, directly between the front screw and the undercarriage hole, I don't want. So I'm going to fill those in, so underside, the underside will look a little bit cleaner and they'll just be the one hole, the one square hole for the stand adapter to fit into. This is quite a simple job, I just put some masking tape over the hole, the bit that I want to fill in. Then I use a small lump of blue tack to make a dam over the hole that I do want to use. And then I mix up some two part epoxy glue, Araldite in this instance. It's a five minute one, so you have to work quick. Just a little blob, 50-50 mix. Stir it up with a cocktail stick. And when it's of the right gluggy consistency you can lift a lump off on the end of the stick and just drop it into that dammed up area that I want to fill. I've also scratched the metal around there with a scriber just to get, get some little grooves for the araldite to key itself in so it stays in there and doesn't fall out. This is a wide shot and you can see that I've got quite a few of these models. I've got one Junkers 87, the German one, and five Spitfires. So I'm working on all of these at the same time today. Here's that picture I spoke about earlier. This is the paint scheme and the decals that I'm going to have to recreate to try and get it looking realistic. I do like realistic models from time to time, especially with the, with the aircraft. Now there's two camouflage patterns common for the Spitfire. There's A and B, and they're actually mirror images of each other. And uh, it depended on the serial number of the aircraft as to whether it got A or B. I think it was Evens got A and B camouflage went for the odd numbers. Here's some more pictures again, just to give me some more ideas of, of where I want to head. I do like that roundel with the yellow ring around the outside, so I'm going to be using that. And also a couple of different roundels. So there's going to be three different insignias on this aircraft, but they all mean RAF. Royal Air Force, and they were all used on the Spitfire at the same time. Why? I'm not sure. Must have meant something to somebody. I'm sure someone out there will let me know the reason why they had so many different types of roundel. That's the target on the side that I actually can't find quite funny. I mean, on a, on a war aircraft, why would you go into battle with a target painted on the wings and that's something for the German pilots to aim at, isn't it, surely? Anyway, I filled that hole in underneath and I'm putting the model together and what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the model with the prop on and the little wheel in the back so I won't be pulling this apart anymore now and after I've finished I will paint the little wheel and the prop black again by hand. Now that little seal there I've decided I'm just going to run some super glue in those seals and just seal them up a little bit and then paint over the top and hopefully it won't be as noticeable. Here's a test fit of one of my stands that I've sanded down and sprayed satin black. They look quite nice. You can put them around either that way or the other way. I actually think I like the other way with the thin end of the wedge facing forwards. And here's another one of those adapters. I've just glued it on the end of a small flat bladed screwdriver and I'm going to use it as a painting aid. 
so I can stick it in there and hold the aircraft whilst I'm painting it. So into the spray booth, I've got this little magnetic auto accessory shop light, battery powered. Click it up there, I've got a steel ruler screwed to the roof of my spray booth. It comes in handy, especially if you've got magnetised lamps. First up, I'm going to give these models a prime, as per normal. And then I've got to try and uh, recreate the camouflage pattern. I'm sort of winging this one. <laughs> And using a combination of magnetic clamps there, you can just hold that little tool I made in the breeze to dry the model. I've got two lots of paint here. I've got Ray Dome, Mr. Hobby, and I've got um, X9 Brown. I'm going to mix the two together and make this uh, slightly dark tan color. The Ray Dome itself doesn't seem quite dark enough. Anyway, things don't always go to plan. So, without knowing it, I opened up this and it's almost a full pot, which is good. Then I opened up the ray dome, and it's very difficult to skin, distinguish from the weight whether they're full or empty, but this one was actually empty. Don't know why it was back on the shelf. So I've had to grab another color, and it's number 71. And I'm not too sure what colour that is. I thought it was sandy brown, but I'm not sure. It's similar to the Ray Dome. It's just a little bit more sort of mustardy. Shouldn't really matter that much. As long as they're all painted the same, I'm sure they'll turn out fine. I'll start off with just a few little drops of this dark brown because I figure it's quite a strong colour. And to my surprise, it didn't really do much. It changed it maybe one shade. So I go for a bit of a dunk, tip some a little half thimbleful there in. That's more like the colour I'm looking for. You've got to be careful when you're mixing these paints because it, uh, it's a bit watery. It's watery, of course, because it's used for spray, spray brushes, air brushes. And it is a bit sloppy, as you saw there, it's slopped out of the pot. It's uh, a signature of, of doing this hobby. You always end up with dirty hands every time you go out and pay for something at the supermarket. You, oh, I am, anyway, I'm conscious that my nails are black or my I've got ingrained paint in my fingerprints. It's just one of those things that you have to put up with. I guess it's like being a diesel me mechanic, you know, they've always got a... A dirty nose where they touch their nose with their oily fingers all the time during the day. So after I've mixed up the paint thoroughly with my little battery badger stirrer stick, I wash that in some thinners in a shot glass. Here's a slow-mo shot for you. I do like the slow-mo shots from time to time. Cleans up a treat. Now this is like a little soya sauce pot from the $2 shop and they're quite good, they come with lids. Great for saving paint that you've mixed up. Well that was quick. I think I must have forgot to hit the record button there. Anyway this one's painted. And look at that, the prop still spins. Give it a blast from the airbrush there. No paint, just air. Looks cool doesn't it? Now I've got to work out how I'm going to do the green. Try to get it look like the, the actual camouflage here. For something different, I'm trying this Art Masking Liquid Pump Marker Pen from Molotow. It wasn't cheap, but I thought I'd give it a go because I do like trying out new things. And to my surprise, it's actually sky blue. I didn't realise, I didn't even think it, I thought it would be clear for some reason, but it's great that it is sky blue it means you can see where it is on the model. So basically you just draw your pattern on the model and colour it in with this pen. 
And then when you paint, the paint that you put on the model does not go where the blue masking ink is. And apparently at the end of the day, it's just a real simple job of peeling the ink off and you have a perfectly camouflaged model, all crisp lines and hassle-free. Well, let's see. So I had to remember to do this in reverse. I had to color in the bits that I wanted to stay brown. And you have to constantly remind yourself as you're going with that pen, which bit am I coloring in and which bit am I not coloring in? It's very easy to mess it up. So I leave that to dry uh, overnight. Now I can handle this without leaving fingerprints. And the guy in the model shop, he goes, oh, you just pick it off afterwards with a little toothpick. It comes off really easy. Well, I'd love to say it did, but it didn't. It was extremely difficult to get this off. Very time consuming. And I tried all sorts of things, even a soft bristle toothbrush, which seemed to work okay, but it did scuff the paint slightly. And there was little bits that you didn't see, and then you saw them. And then when you thought you finished, you find another bit. And all in all, it was very time consuming, and I think I would have been better off just doing it by hand. You have to handle the model so much too. It's uh, not the best practice really, the day after you've painted it. Now I said I was gonna give these models away, three of them at the end. This one here I'm going to keep because it's not going to be up to scratch as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't want to give this one away. The ones I give away I want to be the best ones I can do. So this is kind of almost like a test piece if you will. So I'm learning as I go and hopefully the, the three giveaway models are going to be really nice. See there there's some green paint on top of the brown. It's gone through the ink somehow just on that wing section. Anyways, I've done the camouflage, now I'm going to paint the black bits, which is the interior of the cockpit and the propeller blade. It's so difficult to paint this propeller blade because it keeps moving as you touch it. quite frustrating really and then every time you spin it round a half quarter of a turn you see a bit that you've missed. Here's a comparison shot, the one on the left I actually painted by hand. For the underside colour I got sky blue but sky blue did not work so this is another sort of a powder blue that I've got. I really should have written down the number for you but hopefully if you freeze frame the video you'll see what that is if you want to buy some of this. It's a Mr Hobby one again. And I diluted it with some of this leveling thinner in the hope that when I painted it on with a paintbrush, because I, I didn't want to spray this, because I figured I'd get over spray on the top side of the wing. So I, I decided I'm going to paint it on with a paintbrush. And I've got a rather large paintbrush just to try and flood the area. And because I added some of that leveling thinner to the paint, I imagined it was going to level out and look really good. It didn't really look that good. <laughs> and I was a little bit disheartened at this stage because I didn't have any I didn't have a B plan. So I set all that aside and put it out put it out of my mind and now I turn my attention to the Stuka dive bomber, the German aircraft. Now this was a very boring little toy model. Just had really basic stickers on there that were all peeling off and one colour. So I want to make it look more realistic. So I've got some more pictures of a typical camouflage style that would be used on this aircraft. And I'm using some Revel mas Modeler's Masking Tape to try and mimic the camouflage pattern that I'm seeing in the picture. So here I've produced some decals and I've imported them into a program called Silhouette Studio which is used in conjunction with a cutting machine called a Cameo. Now here the cutting edge is shown in red to be offset by 0.2mm so hopefully it will cut inside the decal. 
As you can see, the program does have its flaws. Here's uh, an imperfection here where it's going to cut the decal in a strange shape. So here's the sheet of decals and it's stuck to this tacky cutting board which I'm now going to load into the cutting machine. I've never thought to use it for this, for cutting out decals before, but because these are circular, I know from past experience it's almost impossible to cut out a small circle by hand with scissors. So we nutted together and we worked out how to program this thing because we hadn't had it out the attic for like five or six years and we'd all forgotten how to use it. So using the program you print out the decals on a sheet of decal paper and registration marks are on there as well and the cutting head has got a, an eye on it and it can read the paint paper before it starts cutting. It just knows where it's cutting and it cuts around anything that you've told it to cut around. So it's a great little machine and I'm quite excited by the prospects here of making some more decals. So you can see there's three different types of circular decal on the Spitfire. So I've, I've made multiples of each. So I'll just select the decal and dunk it in some lukewarm water as per normal. I'm using a brush today just to put some extra moisture on the area where I'm going to place the decal. This is white backed decal paper that I bought online. I only got it today, the day I'm using it. So I was cutting things a bit fine. I didn't know if I was going to get this video out in time. I apologise for my big fat hands being in the way there. Basically, I slid the decal off the backing paper, held it in place with a blunt toothpick and dragged the backing paper away from the underside of the decal. Now I'm just squeegeeing out any excess moisture that may be sitting underneath the decal so that it can stick to the model. Now, the underside of the wings here, they're the worst ones because they're right over those embossed letters where it tells you where it was made and I did struggle to get them to sit in amongst all the little bits but I got there with a little bit of persistence and I did use some decal softening solution as well. Now that's a great one on the side because it partially covers the seam as well which is a, a bit of a help so it all adds to the overall effect at the end to make it look like a nice little model. So here's a quick reminder of what we started with. I had, uh, how many do I have? Four or five of these. All in similar state of repair, or disrepair I should say. Yeah, this took longer than normal, this video. It took me almost a week to get all these little models painted up and ready to show. Now this is the one with the undercarriage. I'm keeping this one because I like it. I'm keeping the, the Stuka on the undercarriage and this one on the undercarriage and one of the ones on the stand, the one that I'm not, not happy with. And I'm giving the other three away. And if you're interested in getting one of these, then uh, may I suggest you leave a comment with hashtag BOB in the text and you will be in the running to win one of these three giveaway models. And I intend to announce the winner in my next video. So good luck if you're up for that. And this is what the Stuka looked like, the Junkers 87. This is my particular favourite as the real aircraft had a fixed undercarriage and this looks actually quite like the real thing minus the bomb of course it was a dive bomber whilst we're looking at these pictures let's reminisce and listen to the the speech that winston churchill gave to the british people after the battle of britain it's stirring stuff the gratitude of every home in our island in our empire and indeed throughout the world except in the abodes of the guilty goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. If you have, please like, subscribe and recommend to your friends.